So we're here at the Stephen Talk House, one of America's great taverns, for a series of shows about great taverns. How those taverns have impacted the history of their town and of the people who patronize them, and why those taverns are so significant to the fabric of life in this country and life everywhere in the world. Well, the Stephen Talk House was built in 1832 by a local whaler. His name was Erastus Barnes, and Stephen Talk House the Indian after whom this bar is named used to walk along these streets in the 1870s delivering the mail right in front of this very house. Hi, I'm Nick Krause and I've been with the Stephen Talk House since 1994, I think. A really long time, over 20 years. I'm sitting here with our general partner, Peter Hunterkamp. And Peter is going to tell us a little bit about the Stephen Talk House today. Well, the Stephen Talk House was built in 1832 by a local whaler. His name was Erastus Barnes, and he whaled out of Sag Harbor. And this is his house. It's one of the oldest structures in Amagansett. And Stephen Talk House, the Indian after whom this bar is named, used to walk along these streets in the 1870s delivering the mail right in front of this very house. And do we know why we chose this name except for the historical reference? Just uh, the, the people who had it when we bought it in 87 had named it this in 1970. Now I know back in the day this place was known for its jukebox. In fact when you first took it over you gave me the old 45s which I still have that had been in the last sort of selection of, of choices that the old jukebox used to have. Uh, and so what gave you the concept of becoming a live music venue? When we got the bar, um, that concept really didn't exist. But my cousin, Cliff Black, he was a musician. Um, the room was much smaller then. That stage was actually a driveway, so we had a little wooden platform. And Cliff played up there with a guy named, a harmonica player named Eddie Mack. I thought we should try and get someone bigger. And the musician John Hammond was, I had met, he lived out here locally at the time and he agreed to play for $750, a $10 cover. Place was packed, and it just progressed. We've had some of the most famous musicians in the world come in and perform, obviously not for financial gain, but just because they liked the place or felt comfortable playing here. Paul McCartney and Paul Simon and Billy Joel and Jimmy Buffett and Sting and Roger Waters uh, Chad Smith of the Red Hot Chili Peppers, Coldplay, have all been on that stage. And it obviously got bigger in 1994. We were able to get permission to enlarge the place, and that meant we had even bigger and better talent. Oh, the first show I saw here uh, with my parents, actually, was uh, John Mayle and the Blues Breakers. And I fell in love with the place that first time I came for that show. And I was here a night when uh, Mick Jagger, who didn't perform, was in the audience. I can't remember what show that was. But. Well, he, he was here in 88. Uh, he came to see Buddy Guy. And he was here in 94 to see Peter Wolf. OK. Um, but a number of members of the Rolling Stones, Bobby Keys played in the club out here. And Mick Taylor uh, played Tumbling in the club Dice. out here. Uh, Tumbling Dice. Mick Taylor played on his own. And Marianne Faithful, who was affiliated with the Stones and dated Mick Jagger, has played here in her own right as well. Some of my favorite nights, either being here or working here, were times where things didn't go as planned. So the power went out, either a nor'easter or somebody hit a telephone pole or whatever it might be. So we had Glenn Tilbrook, Rick Danko, Martin Sexton, and literally a type of situation where you want to talk about unplugged, there was nothing to plug into because there was no power. It's, it's very hard to come up with your favorite memories here. It's kind of like comparing uh, your favorite moments with a woman or your favorite day with a friend. Um, I don't know why I'll tell you this one in particular. Chris Christopherson was playing with the Highwaymen, which was playing out in Montauk, and Christopherson was scheduled to play here. This is around 1991, and it was right after the first Iraq War. Um, Christopherson, who's known for his very left-wing political views, and Waylon Jennings, who's known for was known for his very right-wing political views. Christopherson sang a song at the ranch, slouching toward the Millennium. Colin Powell was in the audience. And Wailing Jennings got really mad and said he was quitting the hireman. Chris, who doesn't drink, uh, went on a bender, um, was afraid he couldn't perform here. And Paul Simon came down and played with uh, Chris Christopherson and, and helped him get through that night. And, you know, what could be 
better than that than having Paul Simon sing America on stage with Chris Christopherson and to know that the gesture behind it was one musician, one human being helping another human being out. Hi folks, I'm Nick Krauss and I'm here today with Peter Hunter Camp to talk about America's great taverns. Today we're at our own bar, the Stephen Talkhouse in Amagansett, New York. The things that is unique to me about this bar is first the staff, and not in any order of importance, but you've got people that have been here for a long, long time. We're really a family. There's a sign here that says customers come and go. Here at the talk house, the employee's always right. I was here the other night for a band called Lucky Chops, and the sound man came up to me and said, I was here 20 years ago doing sound for John Entwistle. He was a bass player for The Who. And he said, you know, you have the best reputation of any club, small club in the world. We're known internationally. Talking about being known internationally, so when I'm here, I usually don't wear anything that says Talk House on it because I don't want people coming up to me and asking me questions uh, or knowing that I'm working here. It's a sort of a, a lame excuse to get out of having to work. But when I'm elsewhere, I figure it helps to promote the club and I'm proud of my association with the club. And so I'll wear my Talk House hat or shirt. And I remember being in, in the Middle East in Israel with you in the desert surrounded by camels and this guy sort of appears from nowhere and and he says Stephen Talkhouse and I go yeah 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 you've heard of it and he goes yes and that's when you expect for the mention of oh I saw Sting there or Billy Joel knocked into me or whatever it might be but it's always the same thing actually is that guy Phil still working there yeah <laughs> I started here about I'd say about 30 years ago I can tell you a lot of crazy stories about Peter the first time I ever saw him this was a Halloween night back in like the 70s that he, he dressed up, he dressed up like a, transvest, a transvestite and walked the whole length of the bar. And I was right behind him. Every time they were tipping him, the money would fall out and I was collecting them right behind there. I, I collected like about 70, 70, 80 bucks. Stephen Talkhouse started working here in 1978. Got to know Peter, right? He's um, a brilliant student. Number one and number two at Columbia. And he could have been a stockbroker, could have wrote a book, but he liked to drink and he liked to hang out with his friends. So he told me he wanted to do it for a living. So he bought this place and here we are. I must say that the Talk House is the most unique club in the United States. The music that's come through this room is unparalleled. I don't care about Carnegie Hall. They may have bigger names, but they can't compare with the music. Uh, my father, grandfather, and great aunt and my mother were the original five people involved. Yeah, Rastus Barnes actually was the original owner of the house, built it in 1832. Um, that fish was given to us for the history of not just the building, but the town. And we've added the extension, we added the back room, the outside bar. So yeah, the little project I picked up was I'd noticed there'd be broken drumsticks or, and guitar picks left. And I decided to come up with this project to make this sign. And this is on year two. So I think, by, I think by the end of next summer, should be close if not done. Yeah, there's been 17 people that, on a, the Rolling Stone list of top 100 guitar players that have played here and another two have been in the club. So it's a pretty significant list for such a small venue. And you got to consider some of the greatest like Jimi Hendrix couldn't have played here. My mother painted this painting. Um, yeah, this was actually the backdrop before we had the photo. Um, she painted a, f a picture of the photo and that was our backdrop before we built the bigger stage. It was interesting just growing up with this kind of Island of Misfit Toys a uh, group of characters that are more memorable than any other staff, I think, any, in any other club in any part of this world. Uh, that could pretty much sum it up right there. You can say whatever you want about him, but I do think at the end of the day, he just wants to make everyone around him smile. You know, you can't ask for anything more from a person. Welcome back to America's Great Taverns. 
little bit different today. We're at the Stephen Talk House, our bar in Amagansett, New York. Peter, you've been running this place since 1987. Well, yeah, and I'm running it with you. You're as much of running it, if not more, right now than me. But be that as it may, yes, 87, August so, 1st. So a lot of things have changed. You've gone from being bad on the phone to being bad by email now and social media. Uh, but anything else you want to talk about? Amagansett, you know, we're, we're kind of one of the anchors of Amagansett, I'd like to think. We've been here for a long time. Yeah, Amagansett's part of the town of East Hampton. We're obviously supported by people from all over Long Island and from New York City. Um, but we've made an effort to be very much part of this tiny little hamlet, and we're honored to be part of Amagansett. The other thing that the Talk House gives us is uh, the ability to help the community out. So if somebody wants to do a benefit here, whether it's for a local nonprofit or a local individual in need, we always provide the place not only free of charge, but we pick up the costs uh, uh, affiliated with the benefit, whether it's being paying a doorman or paying a sound man or two or cleaning it up. And we always make a contribution to the charity because we're making money by the bar being crowded. So we make a point of going back to, and, and giving back that to the community. Um, the charity that's had the most significance that really got kick-started out of this bar was the Wounded Warrior Project. And back in 2003, we had done a couple concerts to help soldiers who were injured locally. And a guy who worked here at the time as a bartender as, uh, and a good friend of yours and mine, Chris Carney, he came up with the crackpot idea that he could bike across America to raise money and awareness for soldiers who were inj injured in Iraq and Afghanistan or really anywhere while they were serving. But Chris biked 4,200 miles across America and raised millions of dollars for the Wounded Warrior Project and got him started. We do a ride here every year in Amagansett to Sag Harbor and back, and it's changed the lives of thousands, 100,000 wounded soldiers. There have been so many soldiers who've come up and said how Soldier Ride changed their lives, and many have said if it wasn't for Soldier Ride, they would have committed suicide. So that's the one we're most proud of. Absolutely, and, and, and so many other local things that no one would ever hear about if somebody's house burns down or someone's sick. Uh, we did probably eight benefits in the last two months. We do them primarily off-season. Uh, the one last weekend raised $11,000 for local guys. So we're always open to doing that, and we work with the community and the people in the community to, to do that, and uh, we're, we're honored to do that. So you look around the place, and I remember spending many a night when I first started coming here, and if you don't have someone to talk to for a minute and you start looking around and you see all the photos on the wall and it's really truly amazing because every photo on the wall is of somebody that's performed here and and then luckily later on I was able to be on the wall and then somebody one day took the photo of me off the wall I couldn't find myself on the wall anymore you were with Derek Jeter I was with Derek Jeter yes and, and then I realized that it wasn't someone taking the photo because they wanted the photo of me maybe it might have been Jeter but no, it was me. I took it. I oh, wanted you did the photo of you. Oh, you did. <laughs> so I'm glad we solved that mystery. <laughs> the talk ass mystery hour. There's a, you know, the Rod Stewart song, Every Picture Tells a Story. I'll tell you just a couple. Right there behind the bar, um, there's a picture of Roy Buchanan. He played here in June of 1988. And this is when we were first starting. And I went upstairs after he had played his set. And he was smoking a joint. And I said, is there any chance you could play longer? Because the place was going nuts. And he said, I never, I never play longer once I've smoked marijuana. I said, I'll, I'll pay you something. His bass player said, how much? I was paying him two grand. I said, 500 bucks. And he says, let's do it, Roy, 500 bucks, one song. And Roy said, you idiot, a guy doing something like this in a place this small asks you a favor like that. You don't take the money. You go down and do it for free. Went down and played another hour. Uh, Jimmy Cliff's over there. Uh, you know, I'm here one afternoon, and Jimmy Cliff pulls up, and guy from the band comes in and goes, do you have a Band-Aid? And I'm looking at this guy, and he, his T-shirt his is covered in blood. And I go, no, you need more than a Band-Aid. you got to get to a hospital. I'll call an ambulance. No ambulance. I'll get in trouble with Jimmy. We had a guy who worked here for years, Jimmy Lawler, drive him to the hospital. The show's about to start. Several East Hampton detectives come up and uh, said, look, the guy was stabbed, doesn't want to press charges. But if he dies, we have to go on stage because one of the wounds is close to the heart and arrest him. I had to go up and tell Jimmy Cliff's wife and him. And I was halfway with, I was through, with you. But halfway through the show, Jimmy Lola comes back with the guy. He's all bandaged up. 
He goes back on stage, grabs his instrument, stands next to the guy, who, his buddy who had stabbed him over a fight over a TV channel changer, and starts playing. The next time they came back was on April Fool's Day. It and they was come back, April, yeah. And they came back like a year or two later to do their next Ed and been back. And they walk up, and the first thing the tour manager says to me, he says, uh, can you give me directions to the hospital? And I said, you've got to be kidding, not again. He goes, oh. well, we just need to pay the bill from last year. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Over there is Eric Burden, who was a fixture in this uh, place. One night, my girlfriend at the time, who also still works here, and I had a stupid argument. She left the bar. I started bartending nude. Um, she came back and bartended completely nude. And then lots of people in the bar took their clothes off. A lot of naked men, some na completely naked women, uh, a lot of topless women. Eric Burden came out, took his clothes off, started bartending with me nude. And uh, a barback came in from Ireland to work the bar. He took one look around at all the naked girls and said, oh my God, you just got to America. This is the greatest country in the world. <laughs> so there are all these, you know, insane memories, you know. Uh, this photographs, you know, it's part of the culture. It's hard because there's, there's almost no room. So to add more history, you kind of got to take down some history. So you try and figure out what's the history you want. They're great when you have their fl original flyers that they sign. Those are important, but I think even better are the actual images of them when they're here. It's a lot of musicians because they're, you know, people come back for the musicians. That's what they come here for. But it's also pictures of, of the other reason people come back, the staff, you know, people, more people know, you know, Larry and Phil, they come in just to see them sometimes. Um, that was a fun night, going back to when I'm little, that's, and that was like my first night where I'm, first time I'm here at night, or yeah, first time I'm here at night. Oh, the great Jerry Cooney will agree to referee the second round. Jerry, we appreciate you attending. You know, you get that, you get that hook by just looking at a picture. You can remember the entire night based on one picture, even if it's of, you know, nothing significant happening that night, but you can go back to that night and kind of relive it by walking around and people like looking at them. Welcome back to America's Great Taverns. This episode's a little bit different because in this episode we're at our bar, the Stevens Hawk House, in Amagansett, Long Island. Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. Peter, this building, the Stevens Hawk House Tavern, is directly connected to the maritime history of our country. Erastus Barnes was a whale captain of a ship called the Nimrod. He sailed all over the world, including into the South Atlantic. He was 27 years old in the 1830s when he was on this whale ship, the Nimrod. That's pretty young to be a captain. This is the Stephen Talkhouse, right? Yes. Okay. Isn't it ironic? Stephen Talkhouse was a whaler himself. He went whaling. He fought in the Civil War. He was in P.T. Barnum's circus. Now, can you imagine if we could ever find the list of men who served on Erastus Barnes's ship? Do you think Stephen Talkhouse was on it? Wouldn't that be a great coincidence? How many buildings in Amagansett predated or co-dated the Stephen Talk House in 1832 that are still standing? Well, right, uh, right down the street is a building called Miss Amelia's Cottage. It's now a museum, but in the 1840s, Miss Amelia, this woman, was living. It's the Skellinger House. That building is still standing. Uh, the 1860 church was built right after um, Erastus Barnes died in 1859. The Amagansett Library building is still standing, and it was built maybe in the 1760s. And Amagansett has the 1803 schoolhouse, probably one of the oldest public schoolhouses in the entire state of New York. Okay, well, we're in front of B.H. Barnes' house. B.H. Barnes and his wife ran a boarding house here starting in the 1870s. But he was also a justice of the peace. So his, the, his office was in this house. There was no courtroom. There was no courthouse then. So if you got arrested, you were brought to B.H. Barnes' house and you were arraigned right here. But just think, Peter, if B.H. Barnes was here today, this was his boarding house and there was a courtroom in here, your unruly customers could be just shipped right across the street and be out of your hair for good. Now, the other thing I want to say is about alcohol. We were talking about this before. 
Um, it's amazing, the Stephen Talkhouse Tavern or bar is named after a Native American. And as you know, Native Americans were decimated by alcohol. Even the people in East Hampton, even though they weren't supposed to sell alcohol to the Indians, they did, okay? And this is how they swindled them out of a lot of their land. So isn't it ironic that a bar named after a Native American is selling alcohol, which really decimated Native Americans? But here's the twist. You live here in East Hampton, you've had a fire in your house, you've got cancer, you've had an accident, you have no money or insurance. What do the people in this town do? They have a benefit. And where do they have the benefit? At the Stephen Talk House. And like my good friend here, Peter Harnekamp, most of what I told you today is true. So we're here with Jeremy Dennis. Uh, he's a Shinnecock Indian. We're out here in Hither Hills, uh, Montauk State Park. Uh, the Montaukett Indians and the Shinnecock Indians were closely related, intermarried. So it's fair to say that uh, Jeremy's a Montaukett Indian as well as a Shinnecock. And he's here to tell us about a project that he's doing to learn about the Shinnecock and Montauk Indians. Jeremy lives on the Shinnecock Reservation. Uh, thank you. I'm, I'm doing a uh, photo and research based project that documents and presents uh, sacred archaeological and historical sites throughout Long Island, New York relating to indigenous people. So we're walking along the trails that Stephen Talkhouse himself walked along as he went from town to town or hamlet to hamlet, house to house to get the mail that he'd pick up. And it, a trail much like the same condition it's in today. And he'd go 25 miles every day. Stephen Farrow Talkhouse, born circa 1821 and deceased 1879 also known as Stephen Talkhouse, was born in Northern Springs, New York, a supposed lineal descendant of the great H.M.Y. and Danch of 1650. Stephen was born in what was traditionally known as Akabonic, on a site still marked by a historical marker titled Molly's Hill. Stephen had been indentured as a boy for $40, a dollar for each pound he weighed at that time. He was a striking looking man, what is considered stereotypical Indian gaunt cheeks, long face, long hair, and sad eyes. He was billed as the king of the Montauks, which he was not, and the great walker, which he was. Stephen's walking feats were famous. For 25 cents, he would walk 25 miles to mail a letter. It is said that he once won a walking race from Boston to Chicago for, against 50 others. He is supposed to have walked from Montauk to Brooklyn in a day, a distance of over 100 miles. He had careers as a whaler, hunter, circus walker, and was a veteran of the Civil War, the 29th Connecticut Volunteers. He was non-Christian, rarely drank, and lived an ordinary life. During his lifetime, he led the Montaukett tribe, who at that time lived in the scattered wigwams throughout the town of East Hampton. In 1867, around the age of 48, he was photographed in a studio holding what was most likely a walking staff. This photo became his iconic image. This image, along with his job as a mailman who traveled long distances by walking, cemented his legacy. His funeral was held in Freetown, East Hampton, which was once a neighborhood consisting of ex-slaves, indentured servants, and Montauka Indians who were unjustly removed from their homelands and in Indian fields. His body was taken in solemn procession all the way to Montauk for burial in the ancestral homelands. So we're out here in the Montauk Indian Graveyard that dates from the late 1700s to the late 1800s. I'm with Jeremy uh, Dennis, who's been kind enough to spend his time with us this afternoon. At our feet is the grave of Stephen Talkhouse, who died at the age of 59 in 1879. There are three or four dozen other uh, graves here in the cemetery. Those uh, Indians were buried in a sitting position with wampum. Uh, Stephen Talkhouse buried here in a lying position the only white marker in the cemetery. Over 50 members of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame have performed on the Falcao stage. So we have a lot of famous national musicians here, but Nick, tell us about some of the phenomenal local musicians and what what they've meant to this community, both the charity events and just at their performances in general. 
you, well, you're absolutely right, but you have to start with somebody like Nancy Atlas, who's just been, you know, part of a fixture uh, in Montauk and East Hampton and Sag Harbor even, uh, going back to when I first started getting involved here. And I first met her out here during an open jam, and I was like, oh my God, you're just amazing. She's like, oh yeah, I live out here. One of the things that makes the Stephen Talk House so unique is how deeply they're connected to the community. You know, within my time of do playing music out here, I have raised millions of dollars with my band for families in need, for people who have cancer, or children that are sick, or houses that have burned down. I have even raised money for fucking Phil Vega's fake teeth. And you know who the first person to step to the plate and say that we have a place to raise money for Phil's teeth? Peter Honekamp. And then Nick's right behind him saying, yeah, yeah, let's do it. You know it's a good night when you're playing here and sweat is dripping off the pipes. Forget about attendance. It's when the sweat is on the pipe and the condensation, and it's so hot you can cut a knife with it. It is just pure classic rock and roll. This is one of the greatest guitar players, bass players of my and I love him. I love him too. Yeah, we, we started here together. That's right. Okay. This is just such a great musical place for everything. Every, every part of it's great. The family, the people that work here. And I think it translates to everybody that comes here. It's just been an honor to be around. People have been playing here since day one. To be around such great talent, and the fact that we can have a band not show up, and every once in a blue moon something gets messed up or something happens, and, and literally you can pick from your, from without even leaving the bar, you can put a band together. And you know, when we started music out here, there were no other music venues. And live music has become such a major thing. So many places out here now have live music, uh, live music and so many great Local people are great local musicians, and it's very much defined the East End. And that, I can tell you, was not the case 30 years ago. You'll see along the edge of this bar people who were very important to this bar at one time or another who have passed. Their plaques exist, or their pictures exist up on the wall. They were all people who kept us going or considered the talk house their home, their sanctuary, a place that they could go when they were alone or feeling a little bit down or maybe feeling a little bit good or wanting to find someone to share whatever emotion with. That's what great bars are. They're sanctuaries, they're meeting places for people to communicate, meet other people, not be on the internet, um, and, and share uh, experiences, uh, memories, create new memories, and that this is one of those great, great bars. Let's give it up for the Talk House, keeping live music alive. This place could be shut down and turned into a fucking Chuck E. Cheese, okay? This is a little song about the place where it all happened, where it all started for this band. <laughs>